welcome. Today I would like to respond to a question from a viewer by the name of T. Witt. Witt asked me a question. He said, can you address the issue of program, programming, putting a program together? You know, that is a very, it, it sounds like it would be easy, but it's not. And, and I've brought some materials to share with you to sort of give you a sense for the thinking that has gone into that question. Uh, there has been volumes written on that question alone. Let me make, let me, first of all, let me make it very, very simple. When you're putting together a routine, an act, a show, you want some kind of thematic structure that holds the whole show together. You don't want to assemble a bunch of tricks. Say, uh, for my first trick, let me do this. For my next trick, let me do this. For my third trick, let me do this. Did you like that? You don't, you don't want to do that. You want to have some sort of overall arch. You have a beginning, you have a middle, you have an ending. As an author, that's the way you basically write. You have a character arch. A character arch means that your character begins in one place and is changed by the story and ends up somewhere else. When you do a theatrical presentation, there should be an arch. Your audience, you and your audience should go on a journey. So you begin in one place, you take your audience on a journey, and you end someplace specific, and that should be intentional, and it should be thought out. There should be a beginning, a middle, and an ending. Your beginning establishes your personality, your beginning establishes who you are and what you do. Your beginning def makes some definitions for your audience. Your middle sustains and builds attention and interest. And then you close with a spectacular closing. I love, I love fireworks displays on the 4th of July because they follow such a, a specific arch in terms of their theatrical entertainment. You get a single firework going up, and it kind of announces, hey, this is a firework show. So now they've got your attention, and now you're looking up, and then you see another, and then another, and then there's, there's some, some unique one that you've never seen before, and then there's some kind of uh, a different kind of a trick going on. There's, there's, there's novelty in, in the act, and then there's just, they all do, do, do. You got these rockets going up everywhere, and there's the, the whole sky explodes, and that's the finale. You know that it's the finale, and it brings people to their feet, and they applaud, even though the people who are doing the fireworks show can't see them most of the time. But there's that reaction, there's that natural human reaction when you when you have a show structured that way. So you're talking about building an act. You want to build an act like that. To keep that in mind. Keep novels in mind. Novels have a beginning, a middle, and an ending. Uh, they, they introduce their characters at the beginning. They build on those characters. They introduce conflict. They, they build on the content. There, it's often been said for writers, introduce your hero, put your hero up a tree, throw stones at him, get your hero out of the tree. That's the basic structure of a novel. Uh, now that's, that's extremely simple. Let, let me get into some more detail here. There's some books. Let me go through these real quickly and then I'll go back through them individually. Magic and Showmanship by Henning Nelms. The Tarbell Course in Magic. This is volume three. I'm going to, I'm going to share some material out of this for you. Uh, Showmanship for Magicians by Daryl Fitzke. Uh, the Show Doctor by Jeff McBride. Uh, the Denny and Lee the Denny and Lee Lecture Notes. And there are multiple books on this subject, but this one in particular is by Tony Taylor. It's called 101 Great Magic Acts. I'm going to get into that in just a moment. But I wanted to just give you that, that quick rundown of, of material that's available to you. Uh, this is Magic and Showmanship by Henning Nelms, Chapter 17. He deals with the dramatic structure of an individual effect. And uh, what, what you're doing when you do a magic show is you're doing a number of effects. Hopefully they're thematically tied together. But he gives you uh, a structure, which is really a nine-step structure for building your magical effects so that they're dramatically relevant to your audience. And I would not, certainly I would not overlook this material. Uh, the whole book, by the way, is on 
act structure and act composition and how to put together a good act. So uh, don't miss that. Now you have the Tarbell course. It's actually lesson lesson 34 in the Tarbell course. It's called Routining a Magic Show. Let me just share a few thoughts with you from, from this particular book. Building a magic program is like building a play or any kind of theatrical production. It must be so designed as to gain attention at the very beginning, hold that attention to the final drop of the curtain, for a person to buy a few tricks from a magic shop or learn them from a book, make the apparatus at home and then present them in any order without rhyme or reason. It's like an actor going upon the stage with words, gestures, costumes, stage setting, but no play. <clears throat> so when, when you're putting together your show, think in terms of a play. What is your message? What is your brand? What are you presenting? Here's the thing about magic. Magic is an art form. Magic is a performance art. As an art and as an artist, you're trying to communicate to your audience. What are you trying to communicate? Who are you? You're, you're present, magic is a, a means, a, 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 an avenue, a vehicle for communicating with other people. It brings us together for a moment. This is, this is what the performance arts do. For a moment, they, they introduce beauty into our lives. They introduce wonder. They introduce something magical. They, they take our lives away from the mundane, away from the day-to-day -day sorrows and pains and suffering, and they give us something to hope for, something to believe in. It's a noble cause. It's a noble thing that you're doing, and, and uh, think about that as you're structuring your show. Um, he goes on to say, No two of us need have the same play. And where we have similar plays, our interpretations and presentations should and can be individual. Now, I'm going to go on over here. Open and close. Put something interesting in between. That's, that's Tarbell's basic structure. Open well. Close well. Put something interesting in between. Showmen know the importance of opening and closing a program. And it must be right, if nothing else. Audiences will forgive a lot if you make a good appearance in the beginning and wind up with a whirlwind finish. Your opening appearance, words, expression, or mystery must give an audience confidence in your ability. The quicker you come to the point, the better. So there's no doubt from the very beginning that the program is going to be good. As David Bamberg, a.k.a. Fu Manchu, used to say, the audience is waiting for great things. Don't disappoint them. The closing number should be a feature number that will send people home talking. And it goes on, this is, it goes on to analyze what a show is. Now, he derives his basic structure from the old vaudeville days where you have a novelty open, you have a monologue, then you have a featured sketch or play, outstanding, uh, outstanding preferably with comedy in, in there and then flash and action at the end uh, and then he goes on to show how the Thurston show was structured that way the Blackstone show was structured that way the Dante show was structured that way um, and gives a number of very specific examples so that is Tarbell volume three then you have this book right here Daryl Fitzke Showmanship for Magicians. Uh, there's not a single page or a single quote in here that I am going to share with you. Uh, the entire book, let me just read a few of the chapter headings. Chapter 1, Do Magicians Need Higher Entertainment Standards? Yes. Chapter 2, Things from Another Era. Chapter 3, How to Find Out What the Public Really Wants. Chapter 4, The Things That Big Audiences Really Buy. Chapter 5, How Music Adds Interest. Chapter 6, Rhythm, Youth, and Sex Appeal. Chapter 7, Personality and the Necessity of Selling Yourself. Chapter 8, Color, Harmony, Sentiment, Romance. Chapter 9, Timing and Pointing. Chapter 10, Surprise, Unity, Character, and Situation. 
and on and on and on. Uh, if you're looking to put together an act, take a look at this, folks. Showmanship for Magicians by Daryl Fitzky. Also, let me mention this to you. Well, I'll, I'll mention it in a moment. I was going to talk about Scott Alexander, but I'll get to him because I'm getting to the Denny and Lee notes here. I've recommended this book to you before. I want to recommend it to you again. It's called The Show Doctor by Jeff McBride. Uh, Jeff McBride did a series of, of articles for Magic Magazine. He assembled them into this book, and it addresses your question. It really does. How do you put an act together? What elements do you need to think about? Let me just share a few things with you from the table of contents. Here he does chapter 6, the shakes, that is dealing with nerves. Uh, very important when you're when you're doing an act. Uh, the serious problem, how to introduce comedy in your act. Um, something I wanted to share with you. It's called The Bends. Chapter 2, year 1. He breaks this into years. Uh, year 1, year 2, year 3. Year 1, The Bends. Uh, you know, wh when you put together an act, you want to think about your prop placement, how you're going to get those props, how you're going to get them on stage, off stage. Now, you might be a close-up worker and your stage is your close-up mat. But how do you get your, your props on and off the close-up mat? If you're a stand-up performer like I am, you're, you're basically platform, you're a cabaret-style performer uh, who works alone, by the way, I'm very, what I do is I have a table somewhat similar to this that I work off of. And I have another table right here to my right. All my props are placed in order of appearance on the prop table. And this is my cue sheet. It goes right here at the beginning so that as I reach for a prop, I can take a look at the cue sheet in case I get lost. I usually don't get lost, but I, I can. That's why I have a cue sheet. So I pick up the next prop and I work with it. Uh, the bends, some guys work out of a suitcase table, particularly in the birthday party environment where they're doing children's shows, and they're bending down to get a prop and bringing it back up. And that is a moment of dead time. It can be. I mean, you can cover it, but, but it can be a moment of dead time. So, so he deals with those kinds of issues that are so important. You know, a lot of guys practice, and ladies too, a lot of, a lot of performers practice there are individual effects, but they don't practice stringing them together in a routine. And therefore, when they go out to perform and they're doing more than one effect, that transition is, has not been rehearsed, and it's a little bit sloppy. Now, you can tell a professional, polished act by its transition. The transitions are seamless. You can't even tell it happened. Uh, they go from one into another, and you don't even know it's happening because it is so seamless. So as you put together your act, you want to think not only in terms of your selection of effects and the order in which you're presenting those effects and the thematic structure that's tying them together, but also your transitions in between. So the show doctor deals with all those details that you really, really need. Now this, folks, this was the manuscript that changed my life. It really did. It was produced by Denny Haney. Of course, I've told you about him before. Denny Haney is a personal friend of mine. He's my mentor and friend. I spent years and years and years studying with this man. Uh, I, th I thought he was a magical genius. He's certainly a performing art genius. Uh, and he produced this, this series of lecture notes uh, to help, help beginning performers like myself understand the business of magic and how to put an act together. He, um, he has a section here called, Who Am I? I want to share this with you. Uh, <coughs> it's, going, it's going to be hard for you to get these. Scott Alexander, by the way, took over the Denny and Lee Magic Emporium. It's now up in York, Pennsylvania. You might be able to get these lecture notes from Scott up there in York. Um, I think it's called DNL. DNL. Uh, but let me, let me share this with you. Who am I? More wasted time and frustration is spent on trying to be someone that you admire rather than being who you are. 
When we dream about performing, we rarely see ourselves on that stage or platform. We usually see what we'd like to be. That is the biggest waste of time in your entire life. While so many of us are busy wishing that we could be David Copperfield or Doug Henning or somebody else, just remember that you have one advantage that they don't. They cannot be you. It is now to your benefit to use this advantage to its fullest extent. We break our necks trying to come up with some totally original act that has never been done before. The big boys out there are doing basically the same old magic that has stood the test of time. It's not the originality in their magic that makes them a success. It is the fact that people like them for who they are. That is so true, folks. You watch the great performers today. And they're doing stuff. If you're watching the medalists, man, they're doing stuff out of Corinda. They're doing stuff out of Anaman. They're doing stuff from Al Quran. That's what they're doing. But they're, they're, they put their personality stamp on it. So most people that aren't really familiar with the principles don't even recognize what they're doing. Because they're doing it from a place of, of uniqueness that is them. He says, it's not what you do, but how well you are liked while you're doing it. Great advice, folks. Great advice. Now, here a little bit further down, he gives what he calls his club date act simplified. The opening. Let me just run through this quick, real quickly with you. Opening personality trick or tricks, feature presentation, audience participation, and closing effect. Now this is not intended to be, oh, I'm going to do opening personality trick, uh, featured effect. It's, it's not quite like that. The opening and closing, yes. But how the show flows, these are elements that you want to include, not necessarily an outline you want to follow. You got me there? So your opening effect, something to get the attention of the audience. Show them what you do and let them know that your show has started and that you are on. Bob Cassidy used to call this taking the stage. Going out there and letting people know the show has begun, you are center stage, and this is your act. Uh, it does not have to be a musical opener or a flashy opening. Any number of things can work here as long as it gets people to like you. That is the thing. You want to try to establish rapport. I know I went to see Kreskin a few weeks ago. And Kreskin, before he did anything, he shook hands. How are you doing? How are you? How are you doing? He shook hands. He got to know people. He interacted with people. There was a warmth there that people immediately appreciated. We liked him. At that point, he could have done anything. It wouldn't have mattered because he established rapport. Personality trick. I call this a personality trick because it is here where you will really get your first chance to talk to your audience and relate to all those who may have missed during the opening. This should preferably be a good effect of the strong nature here as you don't want to lose them after your opening. A strong effect to open followed by a strong effect to further develop your personality lets them think that everything you do is going to be good. You can do more than one trick here if you really need the time. Feature. This is the routine done to music that breaks up the talking. This is where uh, Johnny Aladdin used to do the card routine. But it could be anything visual and strong. A good move here is to do something that is strong enough to be a closer, but does not have the applause getting finished that is needed for a closing effect. It can be an illusion, a manipulative type effect, or basically anything skillful, anything amazing enough to make them sit up and take notice. Then you want to include some audience participation. Now you can go into your lengthier routines with some heavier comedy, audience interaction, then your closing number. This is where you really let them know that you are through. Many times this should be the absolute strongest thing you do. Now let me tell you how I approach closing numbers a little bit. I kind of, and if you watch the way some magic on television is structured, they do it this way. Coming up, folks, coming up, ladies and gentlemen, this, coming up, this. 
So, so you have this build throughout the show. Uh, my audience is anticipating that I'm going to finish with this effect. I'm going to get into that in a second. I'll show you how I do that. But it also adds some thematical uh, structure to your show when you do it that way. So that's Denny's space at one, two, three, four, five elements, right? Five elements to a good show. The opening, the personality effect, the feature, the audience participation effect, and the closing number. Uh, remember, remember the, er, the basic structure. Open strong, build interest, close strong. Basic structure. Uh, Denny and Lee lecture notes, uh, fantastic stuff. Now, books like this, uh, this is chock full of routines. So you, you read all the theory here, right? And then you get to go and you get to see what the masters did. Uh, if you have, now they don't give you a lot of detail in here. They, they sort of, there is some description, but uh, the value of these books is that it actually shows you the way shows were structured. And some of these guys were vaudeville, so they did the show over and over and over again. And, uh, and so you really get polished material in here to see that. Now, let me share some, uh, some personal things with you to give you some, some sense. Oh, oh before I, I leave the Denny and Lee uh, lecture notes, uh, Denny and Lee also mentored, he mentored many, many people. But one of the folks he mentored was a gentleman by the name of Scott Alexander. Scott Alexander took over the Denny Lee Magic Emporium after Denny uh, passed, crossed over. And uh, the, you might be able to get these lecture notes from him, but he has a five DVD set series called, it's called Standing Up on Stage. And it is entirely devoted to putting your act together. I highly recommend it to you. Five DVDs, folks. I'm, I'm presenting what is maybe 15, 20 minutes on act, act structure and act development. Uh, Scott Alexander devotes an entire five DVD set to it. And he also shares some of the effects that make up the act uh, in that DVD series. So I highly I'm going to put the links below so you can access that if you, if you want to. And I recommend that you do. Uh, so, <coughs> two acts that I want to go over with you. I, um, I want to talk to you about my, my Grand Illusion show and also the act that I'm doing right now. Now this, this is my cue sheet for my Grand Illusion show. I used to have one of these on either side of the stage in the wings. The audience obviously could not see it. Uh, one of the advantages, one of the advantages of doing a Grand Illusion show is that you have people you're working with and, uh, and they can follow the outline, they bring props on and off. You just stand center stage and do your thing. Uh, you don't have to worry about prop placement. You don't have to worry about getting things on and off the stage. You just stand there and entertain. That's all you have to do. If you watch uh, any of the great masters, that's basically what they're doing. But most of us, and today I don't, most of us do not work with a partner. We do not work with someone that can carry props on and off the stage. So we have to do it a little differently, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. But this was my Grand Illusion show. I opened with the dollhouse, and I did that for a number of reasons. It was to music. Uh, I opened with the dollhouse because I wanted to introduce my assistant, Jill, in a magical way. I wanted the audience to perceive that I was magical and that Jill was magical as well. So I had this interaction with a doll. I put the doll into a dollhouse. Magic took place, and this full life size human being came out of this dollhouse. Tremendous opening effect, uh, got good reaction from my audience. Then I did the cups and balls. The cups and balls is a classic of magic. I did it talking, I had a lot of patter. Uh, it, it gave me an opportunity to interact with my audience. The Delbin Chopper was next. The Delbin Chopper was an audience participation effect. It was a little bit scary because it involved the blade coming down, passing through both my arm and the, and the audience member's arm. Then I did the sword cabinet. This was two music. It was a grand illusion. Uh, Jill went into a cabinet. We pushed swords in. It was thrilling. Um, the spaghetti nightmare is my version of the professor's nightmare. Notice the classics here. This is a ch the cups and balls, the, the professor's nightmare. The cut and restored rope, uh, 
this was a talking routine. This was an audience participation. The zigzag. Most of the time I got an audience member up for the zigzag. I let them stand in the cabinet so they could see how tight the cabinet was. The neck twister was a comedy routine that people just loved. Jumbo jest was a, a jumbo card routine. Dynamite was the spot card routine. Uh, the the load a bowl. Uh, the load a bowl, by the way, is a good running gag. I didn't mention that, but but in many acts, including the act that I do today, you should have some sort of a running gag that is something that you come back to over and over again that provides some thematic structure to your show. So it's not uncommon for the load a bowl to be used. You go out, and you you empty it, you put it down, you go on with your other effects. You come out, you empty it, you put it down. I didn't do it that way. I had a story. Uh, that I did with it, that I really liked. Then the, the Chinese sticks, once again, classic. The linking rings, the multiplying bottles, and the metamorphosis or the sub trunk. That was my structure. This whole show took an hour to perform. Uh, that's another another thing. I don't know where you're going to be performing, um, but where where I perform, I work for an hour at least. Um, so, so when I put my act together, I want to structure it such that I can do an hour and that it's entertaining throughout. Uh, there's no filler in my shows. If something's in there because it's a filler, I pull it out. Um, so every, everything should be exciting. Everything should be exciting to you because if it's not exciting to you, it will not be exciting to your audience. But that was my, uh, my illusion show when I did the show. We did this for... Didn't do this exact show, but we did a variation of it for 10 years. And uh, I thought it was a good show. It's, it's a good structure. Now, let me talk about the show that I do today. This was the cue sheet that I used in the Illusion show. As I said, this was, this was on the wings on either side so that I could see it. This is my cue sheet that I use today. Um, it is the font size on here, the font size, this is about a 14 or a 16 font size. This down here is a is a 11 or a 10. Um, the big notes, you notice here too, let me show you this again, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. Uh, that way, when you glance at it, you can pick, your eye can pick up easily uh, what you need to see without struggling to find where you are on the page. The same over here. You have uh, highlighted, highlighted, highlighted. You notice this is every other effect is highlighted. So that as I'm performing, now this, I have two tables. I have the front table that I perform off of. My side table where my props are, this sets on the side table. If I get lost, all I have to do is glance. And I can see exactly where uh, where to pick up and where to go on. There are about 22, 23. Now, how you judge a routine, these, these all blend together rather well. But there's about 20 some odd routines in this show. This show runs a strong hour. I could do probably, I couldn't do 90 minutes, I don't think, but I could probably do an hour and 15 minutes easily. Or, if I wanted to abbreviate it, I could cut it down to 45 minutes. Uh, and I can do that on the fly. And by the way, what I'm doing today, sometimes I get in front of an audience and I have to change what I'm doing on the fly. Uh, because the, the situation isn't what I was told. Uh, so I have to make adjustments as I go. And it's fairly easy to do with this routine. I, I don't have trouble doing that, but this is something to be aware of. Some people will tell me do an hour, but they really want me to do an hour and 15 minutes. Or some people will say do an hour, but they really want 45 minutes. And so when I get on the scene, I can sort of judge that and kind of kind of go with the flow. Um, but let me just go over a few things with you on this. My opening today is, is a dialogue. I actually, and, and I know a lot of guys watching this are going to say, you got to be kidding me. Uh, but I think it's so important to establish rapport. So I, I'm introducing myself. I'm taking the stage. I'm letting people know I'm there and how are you and how are you doing. And, and we're getting some interaction going before I ever do anything. And then my, my actual first effect is something I learned from Bob Cassidy. It's a psychological effect, the kind that Banachek does. And uh, this kind of effect, I'll tell you why, I'm not going to tell you much about it because it's still active. It's in my show. 
Um, but I like it because it gets every audience member. In, I'm asking, I'm, what I'm saying to people is, I'm going to project an image into your mind. So now everybody in the audience is paying attention. Everybody is trying to get that image that I'm projecting. And when I reveal what the image is, more than half of them got it. So they're like, wow. So mind reading has happened right away. And I have them from the very beginning. And then I can go into some more elaborate routines. Um, my closing, my strongest effect is what I'm calling a staple gun roulette. It's basically a roulette routine. You see a lot of mentalists today are doing roulette routines. Scott Alexander has one. I think it's called Smashed, where he, he breaks up a bottle, puts the bottle uh, under, under paper bags, and smashes his hand, uh, hopefully on, on ones that do not have the broken bottle under it. Now, actually, I actually purchased that trick. I don't do it. I do another version. I do uh, the staple gun routine because I think it's it's extremely portable. Uh, whereas the the smash routine is less portable. It's less economical. There's a lot going that that kind of hurts it, uh, in my opinion. So so I do a different routine. Arguably that's the strongest effect, but I don't close with it. It's the second to the last effect. Now I'm getting into a nuance here, but some some performers will do their their fine their their closer the one that's intended to say the show's over and then they do sort of an encore after that well i have a running gag so to speak it's not a gag but it's a running effect that runs through my show i introduce a combination lock and i tell the audience that i'm going to project there's four numbers i'm going to project the numbers into their minds so at various times during the one hour show i stop and say i'm going to project a number to your mind and I write it on a chalkboard, the number they gave me. So, so as I go through the show, I have one number, two numbers, three numbers. And then after I do the staple gun routine, then I get the final number. We put those numbers in the combination lock and it opens. And that's where I close. Uh, so there's a psychological dynamic to that. But I wanted to share that with you. Now, when I used to do kid shows... I didn't have a, a cue sheet this big. I was working out of a small suitcase table and I had, I had a cue sheet that was basically an index card uh, with the effects written on it and highlighted this way that, that went into the top corner of my, of my table. Um, well, t I, I hope uh, this gave you some ideas as to what you need to do to put together your act. Uh, again, to, to summarize, uh, you need a strong beginning. And I would recommend that you take the effect that you are the most comfortable and the most confident with, the one that you feel like this really, this is real magic to me. Uh, put that first, present that first, and, and let your audience really, really get to know you, let, make, let them bond with you. And then uh, as you build the rest of your, your show, think in terms of how am I going to uh, thematically tie this this together so that it's not just one trick, two tricks, three tricks. And then think about your closer. What really says to my audience, man, this was fantastic. What a great way to end the show. Uh, that's your closer. And almost anything can be a closer. It's a matter of showmanship, really. It's a matter of building it up to that, to that extent. But certainly some things lend themselves to it more than others. Um, if you have specific questions, please, please ask. I'd be happy to answer. Lots of references for you. I hope you enjoyed it, folks. Please comment down below. Comment, subscribe. Uh, I want to hear from you. And I will see you next time. Thanks so much for joining me.